Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar AS Academy. Displayed our list of news articles selected for today's analysis and their page numbers in different editions of the newspaper. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the timestamping of the discussed articles are provided in the description and also in the comment section for the benefit of the viewers. Now let us move on to the analysis of first news article. Now we know that COVID-19 crisis has created lots of job losses, income losses, losses for businesses. All these have created huge economic impact around the world across several nations. One of its major impacts is worsening of existing poverty and pushing more people into poverty. So the author of this editorial offers a tool to eradicate poverty. In the analysis of this article, we'll see about this tool and the syllabus relevant for the analysis is highlighted here for your reference. Now the ongoing COVID crisis is creating changes in the society and also in the economy. So author worries that these changes will likely aggravate or exacerbate new challenges accompanying fourth industrial revolution. So in this context, we should know what do we mean by first industrial revolution, second industrial revolution and third. See the transformation of industry and the economy in Britain between the years 1780s and 1850s is what is referred to first industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution was triggered by water and steam power that helped to move from human labor to mechanical manufacturing. So the first industrial revolution is strongly associated with new machinery and new technologies. The second industrial revolution happened after 1850 with the expansion of new areas like chemical and electrical industries. This second industrial revolution was built on electric power to carry out mass production. It is in this period Britain fell behind and it lost its position as world's leading industrial power as it was overtaken by Germany and the United States of America. Now when we come to third industrial revolution, it relates to the rise of electronics, telecommunications and computers. It used electronics and information technology to automate manufacturing. It also opened the doors to carry out space expeditions, research and biotechnology. The fourth industrial revolution is the present revolution called as Industry 4.0. It indicates the current trend of automation and data exchange in manufacturing technologies. We can see this industrial revolution is characterized by increasing digitization and increasing interconnection of products, value chains and business models. Now this industry 4.0 is driven by an amalgamation of emerging technologies, say for example Internet of Things, Augmented Reality, Artificial Intelligence, Simulation, Cyber Physical Systems. It revolves around certain disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence. Here when we say disruptive technology, it refers to an innovation that significantly alters the way of operation of consumers, the way of operation of industries or businesses. And this industry 4.0 by converging real world with virtual world is to bring huge productivity gains that was never seen before. But if you carefully observe in each industrial revolution, the need for human capital is reducing or diminishing. The major reduction can be witnessed in the current industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution. There is less availability of jobs and even if there is availability of jobs that require extraordinary skill set. Author has given an example with reference to Silicon Valley. When we say Silicon Valley, we refer to a region in South San Francisco of California. And this Silicon Valley is home to some of world's largest technology corporations like Apple, Google, Facebook, etc. And according to the author, these tech giants, they have a cumulative market capitalization of more than 4 trillion US dollars. But together, if you see, they employ just 12 lakh people. So here we can witness less availability of jobs and even if jobs are available that require extraordinary skill set. So end of the day this means less number of people are employed and coming to the present scenario more number of people are falling into poverty because of lack of income that is further aggravated by COVID-19 crisis. But if you see even before the pandemic India was struggling to find enough opportunities for more than 10 lakh job aspirants who were entering the job market every month. 
So at present, the condition is worse in our country. So therefore, to mitigate and also to eradicate poverty, author suggests the tool of universal basic income program. Now, with reference to universal basic income, it is based on an idea that a just society, which is morally right and fair, it needs to guarantee each individual a minimum income, which these individuals can rely upon. And this minimum income has to provide the necessary material foundation for a life with access to basic goods and a life of dignity. So it requires that every person should have a right to a basic income to cover their basic needs just by virtue of being citizens. Generally, if you see this universal basic income program, it has three components. One is universality, then unconditionality, and thirdly, the agency. Here, the receiver or the beneficiary is the agency. So according to universal basic income, it takes individual as the unit of beneficiary and not as a household. So this is to benefit the life of vulnerable individuals within households, say for example, women, transgenders and other vulnerable individuals. The reason why we say women here is, in many households, women are part of unpaid work and unpaid care work. They are also not recognized as well. So this is the reason why UBA is deliberated as an effective poverty eradication tool. According to the author, many individuals support the scheme, say for example, Nobel laureates in economics, Peter Diamond, Christopher Pisaridis, and even tech leaders like Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk. So as a whole, UBA gives the provision of an unconditional fixed amount to every citizen in a country. If you see some countries like Kenya, Brazil, Finland, Switzerland, they have started controlled universal basic income pilot program to supplement or to assist financially their population. There is one argument with respect to universal basic income that is achieving equity is more important than achieving equality. This is because universality creates opposition as cash transfers will also be given to rich or well-off individuals as well. And there are two reasons for opposition here. One is that the provision of cash transfers to the rich, it opposes the idea of equity and state welfare for the poor and it also burdens the state with fiscal cost. And therefore, because of these reasons, if you see the economic survey of 2016-17 and even the International Monetary Fund, they have proposed quasi-basic income schemes. This quasi-basic income scheme is to act as an effective means of alleviating poverty and hunger and it leaves out the well of top 25% of the population, that is the rich individuals. Even the economic survey calculated the fiscal cost of a universal basic income program after adjusting to inflation for the year 2016-17. It was to be calculated at around rupees 7,620 per year for an individual. So if you leave top 25% of rich population or rich individuals for target quasi-universality rate of 75% in India, the fiscal cost amounted to 4.9% of GDP. An economic survey called this principle of quasi-basic income scheme as de jure universality, de facto quasi-universality. That is, rightfully, there can be UBA universality, but in reality or in effect, it should be quasi-universality. The benefits here will be, if implemented, for targeted households with units as individuals, incomes will increase almost Rs. 40,000 per year for one single household if you take average Indian household size to be approximately 5. But because of the cost involved in implementing such a program, there is no much political will to implement UBA. However, this COVID-19 crisis seems to be the best time to implement such a program. One of the reasons is because even IMF has projected global growth in 2020 to plummet to minus 3 percentage. And this is the worst since Great Depression of 1929. And coming to India, it is projected to grow at 1.9%, but still unemployment rate is going to increase. Additionally, experts also predict that lockdowns in some format will always exist until a vaccine or a cure for the disease is invented. So this will be even more detrimental in practice for India as 90% of India's workforce are in the informal sector. In reality, they are without minimum wages and without social security, most of them at least, and migrant laborers have undergone the extreme stress. 
So according to the author, one way to ensure the sustenance of vulnerable workforce and migrant laborers amidst the pandemic, introduction of unconditional regular paychecks at maximum universality through UBA. This could be applied at least till the normalcy of the economy. That is why the title is, it's time for a universal basic income program in India. With this, we come to the end of analysis of this open editorial article. We saw about universal basic income, to be specific, quasi-basic income program as suggested by the economic survey. We saw about first, second, third and fourth industrial revolutions and various points with reference to basic income program for citizens. Now let's move on to next news article. This news article states that SpaceX spacecraft successfully docks with International Space Station. Most of us are aware of the name Elon Musk and his company SpaceX. Now SpaceX is in the limelight for taking two NASA astronauts to the International Space Station. In this context, let us discuss in brief about SpaceX and the International Space Station. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference. See, SpaceX is a commercial private space company that designs, manufactures and launches world's advanced rockets and spacecrafts. Founded in the year 2002 by Elon Musk, it was formed to revolutionize the transportation to space. It has the ultimate goal to make life multi-planetary. That is to make human beings live actually even in planets other than Earth. Now, the headquarters of SpaceX is in California, United States of America. SpaceX is the only private company ever to return a spacecraft from low Earth orbit, the milestone it achieved in the year 2010. In May 2012, Dragon spacecraft of SpaceX, it attached to the International Space Station, exchanged cargo payloads and returned safely to Earth. Till then, this technically challenging task was accomplished only by space agencies of governments. And since this achievement, Dragon has delivered cargo to and from the space station several times, providing regular cargo resupply missions for NASA. Now let's come to the news article. It states, for the first time in history, NASA astronauts were launched from American soil in a commercially built and operated American crew spacecraft. Two NASA astronauts were taken to the International Space Station by SpaceX Dragon spacecraft. And this marks the beginning of a new age in commercial space travel. The news article states that with this, SpaceX has become the first private space company to launch people into the orbit. The milestone, which so far has been achieved only by three governments, the United States, Russia and China. Now coming to the Dragon spacecraft, it is capable of carrying up to seven passengers from Earth to Earth orbit and also it can bring them back and even they are saying that it can take them to even beyond Earth orbits as well. It is said to be the only spacecraft currently flying that is capable of returning significant amounts of cargo to Earth. And now it has become the first private spacecraft to take humans to the International Space Station. Know that the Dragon spacecraft was carried by the Falcon 9 rocket or the Falcon 9 launch vehicle. Now this Falcon 9 launch vehicle or rocket is a reusable rocket. It's a two-stage rocket that is designed and manufactured by SpaceX. It aims at reliable transport of people and safe transport of people and reliable and safe transport of payloads into Earth orbit and even beyond. And Falcon 9 is said to be the world's first orbital class reusable rocket. The reusability here is important as it allows SpaceX to refly the most expensive parts of the rocket that helps in bringing down the cost of space access or the cost of launch. Let's conclude this discussion by discussing in brief about the International Space Station. See, it is a large spacecraft that is in orbit around the Earth. It's a unique science laboratory and it serves as a home to crews of astronauts, cosmonauts. Know that it is located in the low Earth orbit. International Space Station orbits Earth at an average altitude of approximately just above 400 kilometers. And since the space station travels at around 28,000 km per hour, it orbits Earth every 90 minutes. Now, International Space Station is a cooperative program between United States, Russia, Canada, Japan and European Space Agency. It is uh, The space station is governed by an international treaty called as ISS Intergovernmental Agreement. 
This agreement signed by the member states on 29 January 1998. This agreement actually provides the framework for design, development, operation and utilization of a permanently inhabited civil space station for peaceful purposes. With the space station being used by astronauts and cosmonauts to learn more about living and working in space, the lessons learnt will make it possible even to send humans farther into space than ever before. With this, we come to the end of analysis of this news article. We saw in brief about SpaceX private space company. Then we saw its few achievements. Then we saw about the recent launch of SpaceX where it took two NASA astronauts to the International Space Station. Then we saw in brief about the International Space Station. Now let us move on to the analysis of next news article. This news article states that the Telangana State Human Rights Commission has directed a DCP to report on alleged assault or human rights violation on a person while in his detention. In this context, let us discuss in brief about State Human Rights Commissions. See, the Protection of Human Rights Act 1993, it provides for the creation or establishment of national human rights commissions, state human rights commissions and also human rights courts. Here, state human rights commissions are to be established at the level of states. So NHRC and state human rights commissions, these are statutory bodies. A state human rights commission can inquire into violation of human rights only in respect of matters relatable to any of the entries enumerated in state list or in concurrent list in the seventh schedule to the Indian constitution. However, a case is already being inquired by NHRC or any other statutory commission, then SHRC does not inquire into that particular case. Now coming to the composition of State Human Rights Commission, it is a multi-member body that consists of a chairperson and two members. The chairperson should be a retired Chief Justice of a High Court or a Judge of a High Court. Earlier it was mentioned that chairperson should be a retired Chief Justice of a High Court but this was modified by the Protection of Human Rights Amendment Act 2019. Now, with respect to the two members, one member should be a serving judge of a high court or retired judge of a high court or a district judge or retired district judge in a state with minimum of seven years of experience as district judge. And with respect to appointment of a sitting judge of a high court or a sitting district judge can be done only after consultation with the Chief Justice of the concerned state. The other member shall be a person having knowledge or practical experience with respect to human rights. See, the chairperson and members of SHRC are appointed by the governor on the recommendations of a committee that has chief minister as its head. Then it includes speaker of legislative assembly, home minister of the state, leader of opposition in state legislative assembly. In the case of a state having a legislative council, there will be two more members who are chairman of the legislative council and leader of opposition of the legislative council. Now know that the chairperson and members hold office for a term of three years or until they attain the age of 70 years, whichever is earlier. And note that both chairperson and members shall be eligible for reappointment. Earlier, the term of office was five years. This was modified by the 2019 amendment. And note that the chairperson and members can be removed only by the president and after their tenure as chairperson or members, they shall not be eligible for further employment under the government of a state or under the government of India. The salaries, allowances and other conditions of service of chairperson and the members are determined by the state government and SHRC has all the powers of a civil court and its proceedings have a judicial character. However, note that the orders of state human rights commissions are only recommendatory in nature or advisory in nature and therefore they are not binding on the state government. In fact, this is placed as one of the criticism on the existing framework. So these are some of the important information with reference to the analysis of this news article. We have given here the functions of state human rights commissions for a reference. Now let's move on to next part of the discussion. This news article mentions that the researchers at the Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute have found a rare fish from Seydukare coast in the Gulf of Mannar. Know that the Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute was established in 1947 by the Government of India under the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare. Later, it joined as a research institute within the Indian Council of Agriculture Research in the year 1967. Indian Council of Agriculture Research is also under the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare. And this institute at present has emerged as a leading tropical marine fisheries research institute in the world. 
Now the rare fish they have found is a type of scorpion fish scientifically known as Scorpenopsis neglecta. It is also called as yellow fin scorpion fish. There are many species of scorpion fish. These fishes are one of the most colorful and spectacular reef fishes. That is they live near coral reef regions. Now, this yellow fin scorpion fish species belongs to the family of Scorpanidae. The Scorpanidae fishes they exhibit variegated color patterns or multicolored color patterns and they merge well with their surroundings. As a result they can remain undetected and also by the predators. And belonging to this family, yellow fin scorpion fish has the ability to change colors as you can see in these images. Additionally, fishes of the family Scorpanidae, they have a characteristic feature of venomous spines. And these spines contain neurotoxic venom for defense mechanism. That is the reason why the fish is called a scorpion fish. When the spine spears a predator, the venom is injected immediately at the point of contact. A sting from one of these spines can be potentially fatal to other animals and it can be extremely painful for human beings. Now coming to the distribution of this fish, it is Indo-West Pacific region that is from India to New Caledonia then till North to Southern Japan and till South to Northern Australia. And this was the first time that this species was found alive in Indian waters. Also know that this species is solitary in nature and only congregate for mating. And it makes its home in ocean on open sand and mud bottoms. Actually, this species is of no interest to fisheries. It is not utilized because of the venomous spine, but it is often taken as bycatch. But significant population declines are not suspected for this species. Therefore, it is listed as least concern by IUCN Red List. So these are some of the information with reference to this yellowfin scorpion fish. Now let's move on to next news article. Now coming to this news article, we know that as per the Union Ministry of Home Affairs, Unlock 1 will be initiated in the country from June 8, 2020, under which the nationwide lockdown will be relaxed to a great extent and companies are to resume their operations. And in the middle of this, Indian Prime Minister is to share his vision on getting growth back with India Inc. And this is to happen in an address at the annual session of Confederation of Indian Industry virtually tomorrow. And this event in 2020, it marks the 124 years of CIA, Confederation of Indian Industry, since its inception in 1895. So here note that CIA came into existence before Indian independence. In this context, let us see few important facts about India Inc. and Confederation of Indian Industry. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference. See, India Inc. is a London-based media house. It provides content and events on investment, trade and policy matters that is relating to India's globalized economic and strategic agenda. It releases a fortnightly publication which is its flagship publication called as India Global Business. In addition, it organizes several important events and this India Inc. was founded in the year 2011 by strategist and entrepreneur Manoj Ladwa. Now coming to Confederation of Indian Industry, it is a non-government, not-for-profit, industry-led and industry-managed organization playing a very important role in India's development process with respect to industries. It was founded in 1895 and as we saw earlier, it is celebrating 125 years in 2020. It partners with industries, government, civil society through advisory and consultative processes so as to create and sustain a conducive environment for the development of India. And as India's premier business association, it has more than 9,100 members and members are industrial enterprises ranging from private and public sectors. And this includes small and medium enterprises and also multinational companies. It provides a platform for consensus building and networking on key issues among the industrial bodies and also with the government and extending its agenda beyond business. CIA assists industry to identify and execute corporate citizenship programs. Now, what do you mean by corporate citizenship programs? This is none other than simply what we call as corporate social responsibility. So it facilitates industries, companies to partner with civil society organizations so as to carry forward initiatives from the side of corporate for integrated and inclusive development across various domains 
say for example actions in healthcare education livelihood skill development women empowerment etc now india has planned to become a 5 trillion us dollar economy as soon as possible and for this indian industries to remain the principal growth engine to achieve and in relation to this confederation of indian industries to focus on five priority areas that would enable the country to stay on solid growth track one is generation of employment then rural urban connect energy security environmental sustainability and governance ca has nine centers of excellence in india and it also has 11 overseas offices also and it has institutional partnerships with 394 counterpart organizations in around 133 countries and thereby cia confederation of indian industry it serves as a reference point for indian industry and the international business community so this is the role played by confederation of indian industry when it comes to development in the context of uh, indian industries we saw on brief about india inc and confederation of indian industry now let's move on to next news article this news article states that the state government of Bihar has requested the center to bear the state share of several centrally sponsored schemes for the next one year. In this context, let us understand the difference between central sector schemes and centrally sponsored schemes. See, when it comes to planning with reference to India's development, there are two types of schemes, central sector scheme and centrally sponsored schemes. The main difference here is based on the pattern of funding and on the modality for implementation. First, let us see with reference to central sector schemes. See, these are schemes that are absolutely funded by the union government, that is 100% funded by the union government and implemented by central government machinery. And mostly, these schemes will be formulated on subjects from the union list. Other than these schemes, there are some programs absolutely funded by central ministries implemented directly in states and union territories. They also come under central sector schemes. For example, we can say Atal Bhujal Yojana, Pradhan Mandri, Shram Yogi, Mandan Yojana. These are examples of central sector schemes. Now, when you come to centrally sponsored scheme, here a certain percentage of the funding is taken by the states and the implementation is done by the state governments. The ratio of fund sharing can be in the ratio of 50% by the center, 50% by the state, or 70% by the center, 30% by the state, or 90% by the center, 10% by the state, likewise. And these schemes are mainly formulated in subjects from the state list to encourage states to prioritize those areas that require more attention with respect to conditions existing in the state. Earlier, there were allegations that some of the centrally sponsored schemes encroach the financial space of the states. Therefore, in 2016, the centrally sponsored schemes were rationalized and restructured. This rationalization and restructuring was based on recommendations by a subgroup of chief ministers. One of the important recommendations was that the total number of centrally sponsored schemes should not be more than 30. So all the centrally sponsored schemes were rationalized and they were classified into three lists called as core of the core, core and optional schemes. Here core of the core and core schemes, they have compulsory participation of states. However, when it comes to optional schemes, states have their discretion. As of now, there are six core of the core schemes, 20 core schemes and two optional schemes. We have discussed these schemes in detail in our February 2020 target prelim series in the 43rd topic. Now, some of the examples for centrally sponsored schemes, we can say Narega program, umbrella scheme for the development of scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, then Pradhan Mantri Krishi Sinchai Yojana. So with this, we come to the end of analysis of this news article. We saw about central sector schemes and centrally sponsored schemes. Now let's move on to next news article. This article appeared in the knowledge section in second page of Education Plus in the Hindu newspaper. It describes the properties of the styrene. Styrene was in news in May second week with reference to an industrial accident in LG Polymers factory located in Visagapatnam. We may expect a question on styrene like how a question on fly ash was asked in the year 2015. Now come to this question, which of the following best describes styrene? It is a flammable liquid. It is used primarily in the production of plastic containers, packaging, synthetic marble, etc. 
It is stored in factories at temperatures below 20 degrees Celsius to prevent its evaporation. The correct answer for this question is option D, all the above. With reference to more information on this styrene leak, I request you to watch the analysis of the topic in the Hindu News Analysis dated 12th May 2020. Now we have come to the last session, the practice questions discussion session. This question is with reference to scorpion fish. Sometimes seen in news, consider the following statements. Two statements are there. Which among the statements given above are correct? First statement, they have a characteristic feature of venomous spines for defense mechanism. This statement is correct. That is one of the reasons why it is of no interest to fisheries. The second statement, it is listed as critically endangered by the IUCN red list of threatened species. This is wrong. It is listed as least concern. Correct answer, option A one only as the question asks for correct statements. See this question, consider the following statements. Two statements have been given. Which of the statements given above are correct? The core of the core schemes are a category of centrally sponsored schemes which mandates compulsory participation of the states. Now this statement is correct. It is one of the three categories of centrally sponsored schemes, the others being core schemes and optional schemes. The second statement, Atal Bhujal Yojana and MNREG program are some of the core of the core schemes. See, Atal Bhujal Yojana is a central sector scheme. While MNREG comes under central sponsored scheme, it is a core of the core schemes. Atal Bhujal Yojana therefore does not come under core of the core. Therefore, second statement becomes incorrect. Correct answer, option A, one only. Now, this question is with reference to State Human Rights Commission. Two statements are there. They are asking which of the statements given above are correct. It is a constitutional body for the promotion and protection of human rights. It is incorrect because it is a statutory body established under the provisions of the Protection of Human Rights Act 1993. So second statement, the orders of SHRC are legally binding on appropriate state governments. This is not the case. Orders are not binding, in fact, recommendatory in nature. So the correct answer for this question is option D, neither one nor two as both the statements are incorrect. Now, this question is with reference to Confederation of Indian Industry. Consider the following statements with reference to Confederation of Indian Industry. Two statements are there. Which of the statements given above are correct? It is a non-government, not-for-profit, industry-led and industry-managed organization. This statement is correct. It was established before Indian independence and aims to create and sustain an environment conducive to the development of India by partnering industry, government and civil society. This statement is also correct. It was established in 1895, well before Indian independence. So both the statements are correct. Therefore, the correct answer is option C, both 1 and 2. See this question. Two statements are there. Which of the statements given above are correct? The International Space Station is a large spacecraft located in the low Earth orbit and orbits Earth every 90 minutes. This statement is correct. It is uh, located almost around 400 km from the Earth in terms of altitude and it orbits with a velocity of around 28,000 km per hour. Therefore, it orbits Earth every 90 minutes. Second statement, recently the Dragon spacecraft of SpaceX became the first private spacecraft to take humans to the International Space Station. This is also correct as it took two NASA astronauts to the International Space Station. Correct answer option C, both 1 and 2. See this main question in GS2. How far do you agree with the view that Universal Basic Income Program is an effective poverty eradication tool? Critically evaluate the pros and cons. For this question, in brief, you can define about UBI program, its components, and that it entails the provision of an unconditional fixed amount transfer to every citizen in the country. Now, for pros, you can uh, take points like uh, it treats beneficiaries as agents and it entrusts them with the responsibility of using the welfare spending as they see required or as they see best required. While it is not the case with other kind transfers, other transfers other than cash. And uh, as all individuals are targeted, there will be less exclusion error or there will be zero exclusion error. And it also provides as a safety net against health, income and other shocks. These points are pros of this universal basic income. You can 
evaluate how far it will be implemented when the scheme is to be rolled out and coming to cons the problem is that in households where male members may spend additional income on wasteful activities and such a minimum guaranteed income may make people lazy and they may opt out of labor market and gender norms may play a role in existing households where men are likely to exercise control over the spending of such transfers then once introduced such a scheme is very difficult for a government to wind up so you can evaluate these points with respect to writing this main answer with this we come to the end of today's the hindu news analysis if you like the video if you would have enjoyed the content don't fail to click the like button and share this resource among your friends and those who are in need of such resources and subscribe to the shankarais academy youtube channel to get notified about new updates